The popular encyclopedia of apologetics records, while it is necessary for the Holy Spirit himself to illuminate our minds to God's truth, it is clear from the biblical writers themselves that this was done both by appeal to the sacred text and to the reasoning of the human mind. As Kreeft and Teselli observe, this process of reasoning includes apprehension, intellectual intuition, understanding, insight, and contemplation. Thus, faith and reason are allies in the quest for truth. The goal is to clarify truth claims and to present a coherent understanding of Christianity, life, the universe, etc. The goal is also to communicate truth without divorcing our delivery from love. The goal is clarity with compassion. The goal is coherence with conviction. The goal is not to win arguments, but to win souls. The goal is ultimately evangelistic in nature. Apologetics helps the believer to solidify their witness for Christ in a world where many want to bolster the reputation for themselves or other things. Stay tuned till the end. If this is your first time here, please make sure and hit the subscribe button so that you never miss a video or an interview. Apologetics is not optional. Scripture is rife with commands to understand and communicate God's nature and his word to others. Paul, writing to Timothy, writes, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, and humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Additionally, there were numerous false beliefs, perhaps on par with the numbers today, which Paul and others had to push back against. Throughout the scriptures, we see written and oral testimonies of Paul's ability to provide substantive answers affirming the Christian worldview. He testifies before Festus and Agrippa, as well as reasons in Thessalonica. Apologists should draw tremendous insight from Paul's methods. As he wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. You know, I too have to be led by the Spirit in my various ministry contexts and conversations as to which approach is best applied to win this particular soul. Because again, the goal is not to win the debate, but to win souls for the kingdom of God. As Edgar and Oliphant write, the Christians were accused of atheism. It seemed from the perspective of the Greek culture that Christians had no gods at all. Therefore, Paul sought to clarify who the Christian God was and how said God desired to interact in the lives of all peoples. Acts 17 gives Luke's account of Paul's address to the council of the Areopagus, opening with a tactful captatio benevolentiae, which is defined as a rhetorical technique aimed to capture the goodwill of the audience at the beginning of a speech. Paul addresses their statue to an unknown God, and this affords him grounds for declaring that he is not preaching any strange and outlandish deity? In other words, Paul's apologetic methodology was not random. He was intentional with how he introduced God and ultimately how he shared the gospel. Copan writes, Third, Paul's bridge-building approach was much the same before and after Athens. Before Athens, Paul would reason with people in an attempt to persuade them, Acts 17, 2-4. In the synagogue, in Thessalonica, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. During his visit to Athens, he was reasoning with Jews and God-fearing Gentiles in the synagogue and with pagans who happened to be present in the marketplace every day. Also, Paul continues the same approach after Athens in both Corinth, Acts 18 and 4, and Ephesus, Acts 18, 19, and 19, 8 through 9. In fact, when Paul was forced by hostile Jews to abandon discussions at the Ephesian synagogue, he went to the school of Tyrannus, where he was reasoning daily, Acts 19.9. As a result, Jews and Gentiles alike heard the gospel, Acts 19.10. Paul's reasoning with Jews and pagans alike was undertaken with the same dependence on God's spirit. 
Furthermore, when we compare the content of Paul's message at Athens with his earlier message to pagans at Lystra in Acts 14, we see striking parallels. What's more, in both messages, Paul expresses the same key theological themes from the Old Testament, including the witness of God in creation. Conversely, Paul's message in 1 Corinthians 2 was for a different purpose and to a different group of people. Paul writes, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not persuasive words of human wisdom. Paul had already witnessed to this group of people, and they had become Christians, and Paul is writing to them in order to share some truths about the faith that will keep them following Christ and away from following false ideologies. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul is attempting to distinguish himself as someone with the message of truth from the Greek orators that would frequently use fancy rhetorical methods to influence those they spoke to. The case could be made that 1 Corinthians 2 shows Paul using a more presuppositional approach where the reality of God and the truth of his word are assumed from the outset versus the more classical approach or evidential approach where evidence is presented in support of a Christian worldview. And this is displayed in Acts 17. Regardless of the approach, effective communication of the gospel is the goal. For this reason, apologetics is not optional for any believer. But I would love to know your thoughts in the comments. What do you think of Paul's various methods? And what methods do you find most helpful when you're talking to somebody who doesn't believe? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And until next time, peace. Thank you.